so much for coming to my stage talk. Um, so today, um, my presentation is titled A uh, Gradual Time. Um, and it's So, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So um, the case was inspired by a sample we received from the day about a forty-three-year-old Mrs. M who was a supranational. She was known for the condition. She was on hydrochloroquine and Nalprol. She was HIV positive and she was diagnosed with HIV. So she was on um, a lamipidine and acrobin covering, and she was changed. Now we can put her admission on to TLB. She has a 494 and a viral load So upon presentation, the family that went to the hospital reports that she had one syncopal episode, and that was a few days before her admission, um, and she'd been confused and had decreased global power. So they said after that episode, she never returned to baseline. Previously, she was going to work. She was completely normal. After that, she never returned to what she was before that. Just in terms of background, um, she'd been seen, she'd been she was seen at the neurology clinic over the past two years with a history of rhythmic myotomy, as they said, of the upper limb. So uh, she was being treated with sodium malprobate for this, and they said one month prior to her presentation now, they said the symptoms had gotten worse and the doctors had added another um, tablet, which was clonazepam to her medication, but for them, it was really healthy. Um, and at that time, she had an EEG done in the neurology clinic, which was So when she did present to the hospital with this history, they um, did a urine lab for her, and that was positive, uh, and they started her TB treatment. So they did a TB gene expert, which was negative. So at this case, at this stage, um, our differential diagnosis is quite wide. So the patient has quite sensitive neurological symptoms. And on that differential included was the um, TB meningitis, uh, progressive hospitalopathy. They included things like SSPE and ratings, um, and then we did some investigations. Okay. So in terms of some of the imaging they did, they did a CT brain, um, which was globally normal. She had no basically lesions or cytopressive pressure, and they did an MRI, which um, showed an inappropriate reduction in cerebral, cerebral volume um, um, and uh, perventricular volume and other abnormalities. They also did some bloods, and the results are shown on the screen there. We see the chemistry, urine, electrolytes, and PTs were all normal. Um, she had a FPC that was also quite normal, but then she did have a triple repellent antibody, which was reactive with the RPRTISA of two. So we don't know if she was treated for syphilis previously or not, but she did have a video of a reactive. reaction. They did all sorts of autoimmune screenings um, and other tests that were negative, but she did have a clear CSF with no cell um, inside with a normal protein. Uh, and cultures that were done in her urine and CSF in her blood all did nothing. She had a negative um, CSF cryptococcal antigen. And in terms of molecular testing, they tested for JT virus, tested for measles um, virus, they did COVID 19 as well, as well as a TB gene expert, which all came back negative. So this is where we meet her because we got a referral sample from the other day where they asked us to do a blood measles IgG and a CSF measles IgG, which came back positive both at extremely high levels. Her blood and measles IgG was 53,800 and her CSF IgG was 7,150. So Stephen wrote a story there underneath, um, which said that this is very high in SSP, but you can't exclude other autoimmune um, conditions. So they also did uh, oligoclonal um, bands on the CSF as well, which were also positive in CSF, but she had no bands in serum. This is also quite important can be indicative of conditions like multiple sclerosis, SSP, neurosyphilis, or... So now we come back to our differential variables to try and, and narrow it a bit. And I don't know if anyone wants to see it. So top of the list is SSPE, because it seems like um, everything's going in that direction. But we do also have things like some of the people 
you can help it. And you also know there's been more fusion bone cancellitis, um, TB meningitis, and then neurosyphilis is still in the mix as well. But um, because everything looks like it's heading towards the results, this is what inspired my talk today. We're just going to talk about measles and a little bit of its implications. Um, so measles is part of the paramyx of your day family, the paramyx of your day subfamily with the belonging to the genus Mobili virus. Um, it's a group of envelope, single stranded negative state RNA viruses. It's got, I can't see all these numbers, but I can't see it. But if you look at the picture there, so if you look here towards our little barrier particle there, we have the surface like protein, which is the fusion protein, which is responsible for um, fusing with the host membrane, and we have the hemagglutinin uh, protein, which is responsible for binding with host cells, um, which is and then measles had 22 genotypes of wild, wild virus that are recognized, but it only has one serotype. So just in terms of the measles outbreak in the 2009-2010, um, there was a genotype B3 was identified as being responsible for causing that outbreak. And subsequently, for all the children that did develop SSPE, it was linked to um, this genotype was linked to those cases of SSPE. So then in terms of the incidence of measles, so it remains a leading cause of death in people under the age of five years, despite there being a vaccine available. So the WHO reported that in 2018, there have been more than 3 million um, deaths due to measles. This was pre-vaccines, pre-vaccines, there have been up to 2 million cases um, of deaths due to measles. Um, in temperate areas, uh, the peak that occurs during the late winter and early spring, of course, cases can occur throughout the year. So, according to the WHO, there was more than 140,000 people that died due to measles in 2018, and at least one third of these were in Africa, with most of them in Africa. So, there's been over 207,000 deaths um, in 2019, and this is mostly attributed to lower vaccine rates. So, just talking on lower vaccine rates, they said in 2016 we had about 132,000 cases of measles. But in 2019, there were 850, about 850,000 cases of measles that were recorded in all WHO regions. Um, in terms of the incidents in South Africa, so under the extended program of immunization, the vaccine is supposed to be administered at six months and um, 12 months. So in our country, vaccine um, coverage remains extremely low um, and less than the 95% coverage that recommended by the WHO. This is found in most provinces. There was a, a retrospective study that was run for the period 2015 to 2020 that reviewed uh, vaccine coverage in our country. And they found that in all nine provinces, most of that period, there was lower vaccine and coverage rates. And so, well, unsurprisingly, 2017 was the lowest, um, um, lowest coverage year. And that coincided with an outbreak of measles in our country. Speaking of outbreaks, there's been several in our country. So 2003 and 2005, there was an outbreak and there was about 1,600 cases there. In 2009 and 2010, there was 18,451 uh, documented cases, and that's the largest so far. And in 2017, as mentioned, there was an outbreak of 186 cases in three different provinces. Um, and in 2022, we declared another outbreak, which is still ongoing now. Um, and to up to date today, there's up to there's a thousand and six cases that um, we've diagnosed so far, and this is just a diagram to show where the problems lie. So most of the cases have been um, found, well, have been recorded in this purple area here, which is the northwest. The green is Limpopo, and the yellow is Kabding. So just in terms of some of the characteristics of this outbreak. Um, most of the people here, there's about 10% of the people that have been that have reported as having this are vaccinated. Um, the 17% are unvaccinated, more than 75%, which is just don't know the details. And most of these people, 43% um, of them are between the ages of uh, four and nine, while about 29% of them are less than four years of age. But um, surprisingly, there's 8.8% of people that are about the ages of 15 that have been diagnosed with this in this current country, which is worrying because we're supposed to be vaccinated. Um, 
And then in terms of clinical presentation, so measles is highly contagious. Reproduction rate of between 12 and 18, and consistent for symptoms in statistical individuals and spread by droplet airborne by the respiratory nerves for an incubation period of 8 to 12 days, up to 31 days. Um, and you have a typical rash that is pedophodal. Um, it appears to be uh, post exposure and it'll usually um, last about. Uh, and um, in young children, uh, the needle especially may have complications. Some of them include things like lymphadenitis, um, splenomegaly, vomiting, diarrhea, croup, even as well. But most cases of measles are self limiting. You can have an entity of modified measles, uh, which may present to those who have partial immunity. And this may be due to things like uh, failure of immunization. Uh, they've been treated with serum immunoglobulins. They may carry protective material antibodies in the first nine months of life, or already they may experience recurrent measles. So now, coming to the neurological complications of measles. This is just a diagram that shows the different uh, entities of neurological complications of measles, and that's just in relation to when you have the measles virus infection. So firstly, we have primary measles and cutilitis, or acute dyspnea and cutilitis, which usually occurs few days post your um, the measles virus infection. Then you can have the measles including body encephalitis or solid uh, uh, meat which usually occurs a few months after you've had your measles virus infection. And then you can have some extreme panic encephalitis, which will happen a few years after you've had your primary measles infection. In terms of primary measles encephalitis, so this is an acute complication of measles. Its prevalence has fallen in recent um, data because we've introduced, uh, introduced vaccination. So its frequency has been calculated from the old data um, of pre vaccination, and its frequency is estimated at about one in a thousand cases. So usually it's in the children aged between five and seven. Um, and with primary measles and cephalitis, these symptoms occurred within eight days of measles. Um, and the one study that showed that most of these uh, cases of primary resistant cephalitis presented as a post infection demyelin. In terms of measles inclusion body cephalitis, this is also known as subacute measles cephalitis. And this was identified in a subgroup of children who were severely immunocompromised. This disease is quite similar to SSP, but it just follows a more rapid course, um, which usually begins with doing so it usually manifests a few months after you had your acute acuteness infection, as you know, the diagram one to seven months. Um, but with this, you have a relative sparing of one year. So rapid onset of neurological symptoms is what these uh, patients will present with, where you'll have things like brain atrophy, um, neuronal necrosis, presence of intranuclear, somatic uh, inclusion bodies in neurons and neurons. And this was just a. Uh, a series of case reports that were published just after the measles 2009-2010 um, outbreak that uh, characterized the SSP, well, MID, sorry, MID, and cases that were identified after that outbreak. So there's eight patients there. And some interesting things that showed up here is that there's varying ages of these patients um, in the case reports. But what was common was that the CD4 counts were relatively low. You know, the highest CD4 count there was 268 with the lowest CD4. And they presented with a variety of symptoms from focal seizures to generalized seizures, um, and other things like hearing loss and visual loss. And then most of them progressed to a neuropathy and all of them diagnosed. But in terms of the laboratory findings, that six out of eight of these patients um, had. Um, serum IgG positive result, uh, and two out of the eight had uh, CSM IgG in the results. Seven out of eight of them showed um, gray matter changes on the MRI. Um, and then also surprising was that two out of the eight of these patients had a positive results PCR uh, on CSA when tested. Then we get to um, some acute sclerosis and pigmentation. So this condition here was first recognized in 1993, but with the introduction of immunizations, it um, disappeared. But now that we have the rise of the anti-vaxxer, um, we are hearing again. 
Um, so this condition is, this is you have a persistent infected measles virus that affects the brain, and it usually presents a few years after the initial infection of the wild-type virus, and it follows a slowly progressive course as um, opposite to MIP, which is a bit rapid. In terms of the epidemiology, it's um, globally it's unknown because it's quite rare and everyone keeps dying. Um, and measles vaccination is known to be protective. So the risk of SSPE is two times higher in males than females, but in total, 78% of cases occur in ages between four and 12, and 40% of these are associated with measles contraction before the age of So the WHO reports the incidence of um, measles as four to 11 SSPE cases per 100,000 measles cases. Um, and there's been some case reports that show that in HIV, SSPP has been described as following a more prominent course. Um, then this is just, uh, this was a, a, a report that uh, detailed the incidence of stomach use, sclerosis, and panic hypnosis in different countries. So as you can see, there's a lower incidence in the more affluent or high-income countries as compared to lower-income countries, like Papua New Guinea has 29 cases of SSPP per million uh, population and this was attributed maybe to lower vaccine rates and was attributed to whole um, chain issues as well they are, they report they're reported to have about three to every three to four years they have a measles outbreak in that country and then india as well has a high incidence of cases being at uh, 21 cases per million and that they intro uh, attribute to Overcrowded living conditions and poor chain uh, issues with the vaccination, causing lower vaccine coverage. Then we had this um, paper here by um, Wendor that was published in California, where they detailed um, they did a review from 2000 and um, from 1998 to 2015. Uh, they did a review of these cases. They identified 17 cases in this review, and they said. They found that eight of them had um, acquired the disease virus infection in California. But in that review, they uh, characterized the age of uh, SSPE as being 12 years of age, with the median five years, and the median latency period was 9.5 years. So this is a bit older in terms of presentation. Um, and this name can be attributed to the fact that they used to they have really good vaccination, but then people Came anti vaxxers and now they're contracting this at a later age. Now it presents. So, in terms of the pathogenesis of the so you have persistent measles virus that infects the brain, and then there's several years post your um, initial infection, and this is despite having a normal immune response. Um, and there are no virus, virus particles that are in the brain, but rather you have this effective viral channel that spread from cell to cell within the brain. And then the cluster of mutations that occur in the viral chain of the brain, and these abnormal viruses will continue to break up the brain. The rate. And then the mutated fusion uh, protein enables a virus to infect the neurons in the first place because neurons don't have the required receptors uh, slammed uh, for measles to enter the cells of the brain to do this. So the normal host response is to have an uh, antibody response that is aggravated and then cells get hyper. That has the cells within the liver. Um, then you also have like the programs that are produced by human cell clones, which is not a normal occurrence because you don't usually have a In terms of clinical staging, um, so SSPE uh, has four stages, and the higher you go, the worse it gets. You start with a mental decline, um, and then stage two is the period in my corners where our patient was. Um, and again, severe mental decline. Stage three, you get a form of mutism and generalized with fatigue. And then yeah. stage four, you have this vegetative state where you have a very constant So once you're diagnosed with this, death occurs usually within one to three years, and it has a terrible prognosis. <laughs> So the diagnosis is made um, using the assistance of the diagnostic criteria, and this is based on a few um, 
Yes. Yeah. So, um, you have clinical, which is about the risk of mental decline, the generalized mild illness. You'll have the EG, which has periodic EG changes in the now. And then the CSF will have elevated uh, gamma globulin or elevated pattern. You'll have antimosis antibody in the CSF and brain biopsy will show either the measles virus or the antigen or intravenous infusion. So this is the EEG pattern, which I just went like fast, but you'll have SFPDs characterized by generalized. Um, generalized periodic complications of discharges, and you have also um, these periodic complications consist of generalized synchronous bursts of sharp, slow wave discharges, and these are polyphasic and usually last for five to two seconds. With high voltage, which then in terms of imaging, you'll have early on the CT uh, brain will be known, but later on, you'll have all the white men. With high densities that predominate, and it usually affects the horizon of so area, and you'll have brain atrophy as well. And then on MRI, um, it's normal early on as well, but later on you'll have a subcortical or periventricular or even cortical brain matter abnormalities. You'll have white matter high intensities, and you'll have progressive loss of cortical trauma as well, which leads to atrophy as well. In terms of the diagnosis, you'll have a markedly raised um, in serum and in CSA. And this is just like which is the hallmark abnormality of the condition. So you also have a little clone fans that have been demonstrated in approximately 90% of patients, including our patients. And then a PCR for measles is a risk of CSA because you won't find virus in the CSA. In terms of treatment, um, there is a lack of randomized control trials because this is um, but the best treatment is prevention, which is vaccination. Um, but treatment is largely symptomatic. So most of the people presented with uh, the epilepsy, focal seizures, so anti epileptics are the treatment of choice. Carbamazepine is the most uh, widely used, along with. <laughs> but um, some antiviral agents, that, well, agents that have been tried include um, isoprenosine, which is a it's, it's, it is the first antiviral agent used, but it's used for its immunostimulatory um, effect. It hasn't proven to be very, very effective at all. There was case um, reports that have been done where. In some patients, there were four patients that showed that it prolonged their death by two to four years and then they died anyway. Other than that, it showed no benefit. Interferon alpha has also been used. Um, but it prolonged their life. Interferon alpha has also been used. Also, for its you know, um, modulatory effects. Also, ribavirin has been used in combination with the other two, but also not to anyone's benefit. But what they're looking at now is this fusion of the time because you know, transneural measles um, infection uh, is mediated by this hyperfusogenic F protein that now develops that leads to infect. Uh, um, neurons in the brain. So they're saying that if they could um, block the fusion, they want to use this fusion with the peptide, peptide to bind the region between the head and the scope of the F protein so that it doesn't fuse, so that it can't infect cells in the brain. Then hopefully that'll be some sort of fusion. That presents a whole new um, issues with, yes, but yes, that's also a of issues. But in terms of our case, this uh, Mrs. M, who is three years old, she had risking life for us. She was on treatment. She had a syncopal episode, worsening symptoms, and 
her diagnosis most likely was SSP, although it was an unusual um, age for presentation with this condition. But we figure she was mostly um, infected with models in the 2009-2010 outbreak. And with her being HIV positive, we would have expected maybe for her to present with her NIV looking picture because she was HIV positive. But things that do not support this NIV um, diagnosis include her level of suppression because she had a relatively spared CD4 count of 594. She her disease followed a more clinical, a slow clinical course, and she had high levels of lymphocytes and CSA, which was not in the future of NIV. And so eventually she became more progressive, uh, more progressively lethargic, grossly spastic and less responsive, and the family requested to take her home and it's in case we can go But yes, yes, I'm right. 